Um, thank you. So, so we actually have some time for the Q and A, and um, I'm going to ask some questions, starting with the one question that had an upvote. <laughs> um, um, so, um, this is from an anonymous attendee, um, and it looks like it's it's um, headed it's toward um, Todd. Has any work been done on the priority concern areas mentioned, suicide and sexual assault slash rape in the military and any connection, intersection or relationship those might have with radicalization and extremism in the military? Uh, yeah, th well, thanks, that's a great question. Um, no, I think the short answer is, is no. Uh, I think there's just been so little research done um, on extremism in the military. I mean, almost nothing. Um, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more in the veterans, but no, I haven't seen any relationships between these. Um, uh, and part of the challenge, of course, is that the uh, base rates um, of extremist activity and involvement are low. Um, you're certainly not going to see an association with suicide because those who commit suicide would probably not be committing extremist attacks um, themselves. So, um, but yeah, no, I've not, I've not seen any evidence of that, but it would be certainly good to look into. Yeah, yes, I agree. That was a good question. Um, so I'm going with someone who looks like they're asking somebody else. Um, this is from Philip Whitman. A general strategy seems to be one, find something that everyone in your interest group can agree is terrible, such as grooming or critical race theory. Two, apply that word to, it, to more and more things that you'd like to oppose, thus teachers supporting LBGTQ students equals grooming um, and anything about race equals critical race theory. Three, watch your opponents struggle to redraw the line be, between the terrible thing and everything you've lumped in with it. And is there a general countering strategy to that one? Now, this this also is, looks like something that will be good for our, our fourth panel, but but it would be great to hear the responses to any of the panelists who who would like to chime in. Well, uh, since I mentioned some of those things, I will say that um, I think the difficulty in finding a strategy is that people don't accept facts so easily anymore. In other words, you can tell people over and over again that critical race theory is not taught in, in schools, in, in grade school or high school. Um, and it does it absolutely does not matter. So um, it's not going to be fighting back with facts, but I think that um, you know a, a strategy uh, is basically, I'm having, I, I struggle with this. We, we talk about this a lot, but I, I think that um, getting people together from various aspects of society, you know, which would be educational, um, <clears throat> educa educators, religious leaders, others who care about, um, you know, objective uh, truth and, and, you know, not um, promulgating theories that not only are untrue, but also hurt people. Literally, I mean, the transgender community is being attacked like physically, you know, these days uh, as, as an example. Um, it, it's really important to get all different aspects, all, all different groups within the social and political sort of active. But I don't I don't have an easy clearly I don't have an easy solution for this, but I think it, I, I'd be happy or uh, to hear from others about, you know, how, how we can tackle this because it, it's it's difficult. I, I think it would be a compelling discussion during uh, panel four, particularly what we heard yesterday from from um, a, the folklore uh, folklorist. Um, let me ask a question um, for Esther. How likely is it that the Bolsonaro that Bolsonaro will take over again in Brazil? And like I know he's oh, this is from Andy Mackey. I know he's been setting the stage that he couldn't possibly fairly lose. What are the odds that he stays in power? given your research and knowledge. Yeah, so what we have with the recent polls, with the recent numbers in Brazil now, is that it's more likely to Lula to win the election for a very, very tight margin, really. So we have, a, he has a chance. Sadly for us, very dramatic, but he has a chance. But of course, if, if Bolsonaro loses the election, we will have problems. Uh, that is, of course, for me. We, we won't have a democratic change of government. We are expecting problems. 
But what kind of problems do you see? Um, I, I'd like to explain this. Bolsonaro is facing very lots of problems with, um, with justice, with Supreme Court, because he has lots of a uh, corruption uh, investigations going over, not just under uh, for Bolsonaro, but his wife, his sons, etc. So what's the strategy with Bolsonaro? If he loses the election, he's going to lose here. Um, I don't know how do you say that in English, privilege, uh, his privilege with justice because he lost uh, the election. So with, what is the strategy? The strategy? He, wants to, he wants to sell the problem to sell the solution. That's the idea. So he wants to sell the idea of uh, he is going to take the people to the streets, he's going to be violent. Um, the amount of legal weapons under Bolsonaro it increased 400%. 400% of weapons, of weapons, legal weapons increasing under Bolsonaro government. So he's selling this idea that, that he's able to create chaos, but just to sell himself as a solution, just to negotiate with the Supreme Court to, to negotiate a pacific solution and to negotiate his way to be able to uh, step out the presidency with no charges. So this is it, nothing new under the stars, the idea of setting yourself at the solution when you are creating the problem. But the thing is, we will have chaos and we will have problems. Thank you. Yes, we see that pattern a lot in the, in these days. Um, we have just a couple minutes left and, and I'd like to ask Darren a question, although Darren answered it and, and Darren and Rick answered it in the, Q and A. Um, so, so Darren, what do people get from believing in something like QAnon? I'm surely imagining half the country is satanic pedophiles can't make the world easier to understand. Absolutely. So, on its face, this seems like a really unfortunate reality to want to buy into. However, it does have a big seduction around it because it starts with a very reasonable place for many people. For many people that are brought into QAnon, it starts off with the really big and legitimate concern over sex trafficking and particularly the sexual exploitation of children. So it's not like it starts with the satanic cabal. It starts with a very <clears throat> reasonable and legitimate, legitimate concern, which does actually exist in reality for very different reasons. From that point on, it poses a way to connect it with existing structures and it helps to reinforce existing political preferences and with the connection to politicians and to other people who um, people may not like for various different other people in society. So it helps to reinforce these existing belief values and then it provides a solution out. In this case with QAnon, it's political violence. By referring back to previous generations as well and the connection with um, existing political structures, that pathway to political violence is also legitimized. So it gives a way to empower people who feel like <clears throat> excuse me, they're being sort of like swept aside and that the world is continually getting worse and more violent, particularly for the next generation. They want to try and curb that, which again is a very sort of like human response, but it provides a pathway that goes from something very reasonable to something that's quite grotesque. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to um, close this panel. Um, thank you all for the, the time that, um, you have given to asking questions as well as for the panelists for answering questions. Um, so um, at this point, I'd like to introduce the panelists. Actually, we are panel. I, I'm going to introduce the responders. Apologies. Um, so if the responders can turn on their cameras and um, again, we have the same responders from yesterday. I'll put their bios in. Um, we have TM Garrett, George's Benjamin, um, Felicia, um, or, oh my God, sorry, blanking out, right, way back, so apologies, and Rick Lego from DHS. Um, I see TM that you're unmuted. Would you like to get started? Okay, yeah. Um, I wanted to add uh, to the actual last question in the Q&A. Um, that's how people believe in the wildest QAnon theory. So what are they getting from it? It's like, like, like they said, the radicalization happens step by step, and they're learned in with the subject, like subjective truths that resonate, and then those radical extremist organizations raise the bar. There's also the sense of belonging, identity, and also the us versus them uh, feeling. But as Darren also said it earlier, most kids at one point believed in a conspiracy theory for the first 10 years of their lives against all logic, 
and then we're upset and denial when the parents busted a bubble, for, you know, and said it's not true. It was just something easy to believe in, a myth, a legend, it's easy answers. But Darren said it starts with an easy, believable, subjective truth. And that way groups like Johanan become a trusted source that you that you trust, like your parents or whatever. Because nobody believes in this cabal, like Darren said, to start with. Um, or with a Jewish world conspiracy. That's, it starts with something lower that resonates. <clears throat> also, I wanted to add something to Todd's presentation. I've been uh, known Todd for a while too. We've been on several panels together. Uh, and it's true, military has radicalized soldiers as well. Like starting 1970s Vietnam War, when they came back, that led to the Klan revival of the 70s, targeting Vietnamese, Vietnamese fishers in Texas and Louisiana. Those, the, this, this other era of the KKK, loose being, he left the clan then to promote a leaderless resistance, promoting individual terror cells. And on the other hand, you got David Duke, who rose up in the same environment, uh, which actually the, the returning soldiers from Vietnam provided there to radicalize Vietnamese fishers. Um, and he promoted that early alt right with no skinheads, no swastikas, no tattoos, no burning cross, no clan ropes. Same happened. Um, after the Gulf War, especially but today too, Afghanistan, Syria, and I spoke to a lot of people who served there and came back and joined groups like the KKK, like the NSM. I know a lot of people Jeff Shib works with, for example, I will mention that in just a minute. Um, the enemy in that case were Muslims, Arabs, that was dehumanized, and that's stuck and they come back those uh, uh, veterans, they have no structure, they're missing their camaraderie, they're missing that rank structure too. And then groups like the Klan and the NSM, which was America's biggest hate group at the time, and Jeff uh, Shub was, uh, was the leader, fortunately he's not on our side, um, and joined these groups. And like Todd mentioned, Jeff, Jeff Shub uh, and agree, most classic neo-Nazi groups recruit these ex-military. It's on the agenda to gain that access to military training and weapons, but not only that, there's more and more efforts today by other groups as well to infiltrate military to at some point in the future to have high ranking officers and generals in position. And if you look at something like January 6th, um, to have those in position, fortunately conspirators of January 6th did not have the backing of the military that time, but it could look in the, a bit different in the future if the military is further infiltrated, not with X, but active neo-Nazis in the military. And then you have also the lone wolf military members or members of Facebook groups that radicalize there without actually being caught carrying members of any particular group. And I want to mention also, which I think is really important, law enforcement. It's always overlooked. It's only all in the military, but law enforcement as well. And there's current, uh, actually, um, just from 2017, former neo-Nazi Bart Osbrook, he was responsible uh, for the blood and honor a skinhead revival in the 1990s and 2000s. He was the police chief in a small town in Oklahoma in 2017. It was unclear if he was reformed. There were still neo-Nazi websites were just as his name. He denied it. Um, until today, unclear. Or Brian Horton, he played drums for a neo-Nazi punk band arresting officers in the 1980s in Philadelphia. And he now works in the domestic counterterrorism for the US Department of Justice with access to sensitive intelligence. Um, reform, uh, he left the hate groups, yes, looks like it, but reform, de-radicalized, completely unknown. And to close mine up here, uh, Andy Mackey asked in the Q&A, I wanted to add something there. If, if that is only a US problem with uh, neo-Nazis or extremists in general in the military, uh, it's not. Uh, staying real quick with the US military, they actually kept the KKK alive in Germany. Many people don't know that. The KKK was brought to Germany in the 1920s. Um, hysterically, actually, Hitler banned the KKK, but American GIs brought it back in the 1960s. That was a big chapter in Munich. And then again in the 1980s. Germany has also a problem, recurrent problem, neo Nazis in the military <clears throat> and law enforcement. <clears throat> that was a scandal. Those connected to the NSU complex and the National Socialist Underground uh, Trial and Terror Trio, um, that KKK members were police officers, or swept under the carpet, they could keep their jobs. And uh, yesterday I also mentioned that, that neo Nazis always were volunteers or mercenaries in war regions, 1990s Iraq, 1992 former Yugoslavia, and now in the Ukraine. 
uh, who actually had a neo-Nazi problem in their own military since 2015 with the Uzov Battalion that was then founded, which was right-wing extremist from the beginning. And this is actually where Putin got his Ukraine has a neo-Nazi problem from. So, but no, it's not just an American problem. Thank you, TM. Um, I don't see any hints from our other responders. Oh, Rick, I see you unmuted. Please. If nobody else is, I'll yeah. refer to my notes again. So um, I'm just gonna mention a couple of things here uh, that I heard today and and perhaps uh, offer some perspectives in, in some cases that are similar to what TM talked about and why I think these things are important. And then I'd like to talk about why I think, I'm gonna say something that's very controversial that that um, I'll get that out of the way up front that a lot of people don't, uh, um, a lot of my colleagues don't care for. Uh, and, and, and I mean that both in my science and academic colleagues and even some of my government colleagues. Um, uh, 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 ideology is, probably dead in our understanding of these things from my perspective, because uh, we've seen individuals in numerous cases of individuals ideology flipping to match the types of cognitive and behavioral uh, 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 outcomes that they're looking for, uh, depending upon the group that they're associating with, either locally or online, they kind of hop ideologies until they get to one that will allow them to justify the types of behavior that they already want to participate in. It sounds a lot like sort of opposite direction, differential association and seeking right? <laughs> approval, right? Um, seeking uh, that allowance and justification. Um, and, uh, and, and when, you know, one of the things that I may have mentioned yesterday is that when the Department of Homeland Security thinks about these problems, we don't talk about right wing and left wing officially, you'll notice, because for us, it's not about partisanship or political ascription, right? It's anti-government, anti-authority, racial or ethnically motivated, um, uh, animal rights is an area we've studied, uh, animal rights uh, uh, and, and environmental terrorism that have caused economic damage and, and, and personal death. So, uh, and, and if we think back to uh, the earlier days of data that we have available is there was an 18 month period in the early seventies when there were what 40,000 bombings in the United States. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, pretty violent stuff. So, so, you know, I think an alternative way of thinking about all of this is, and, and people have mentioned this throughout, but we really keep coming back to the ideology um, and, and addressing the concerns of, and, and, and statements and, and history of that ideology when I don't think the ideology matters all that much. I think there are people that are power seeking and, and I think that people can be manipulated and, and hate and fear gets votes, right? And, and, and so um, uh, with the military thing, this is also not new. I like to try to think about things in historical context and one needs only to look at the policies and actions that the US military took in the 50s and 60s when, um, when uh, a, a number of very high ranking uh, uh, people in the US military were um, uh, uh, members publicly, members of the John Birch Society and the types of things that they did then. Uh, it, it's. Uh, the military fired senior generals, just threw them out uh, because of some of the public statements they made in support of racist ideologies and, and that type of thing. So um, uh, uh, full disclosure for everybody, I've been in the military for 33 years. I've been in both the Navy and the Air Force, um, uh, full-time and part-time. I'm still actually in part-time. I'm a lieutenant colonel in the Air National Guard. I was activated and deployed recently, and I got to deliver the extremism stand down day training to all my people <laughs> when I was deployed. And it was a pretty interesting meeting. 
I put a note in here. There have been surveys done before. The Air Force is highly conservative. I don't think education is the answer. I don't think you're getting a different class of people necessarily, you know, uh, overall. Um, uh, I don't think we know, though. I, 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 so I can only say I don't think, right, because we don't know. Um, what I can say is my experience is that the Air Force compared to the Navy, and I've been in both, the Air Force is highly, highly conservative and not accepting of diversity of ideas compared to my experience in the Navy, if I were to compare the two. And when I pondered this as a, as a social and behavioral scientist, I think it probably has a lot more to do with the proximity to which people have to live and work together and depend on each other for very serious potentially life-threatening kind of work <laughs> and in the air force people aren't in a lot of danger go look at memes online it's like you know if your comms go down in the field it's bad but in the air force if your wi-fi goes down at the hotel call the front desk they'll fix it right it people aren't forced to live in dangerous close conditions with other people who do not look like them and do not come from their background when you do, I think it really builds a lot of tolerance. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about public organizations and extremism today, it, uh, again, TM, um, uh, 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 DHS right now is funding multiple grants to study extremism in American law enforcement. Uh, and, and this has largely grown out of evidence that's been in the courts, been in the news, been in administrative files about um, some pretty crazy um, uh, outed uh, uh, racist and anti-government stuff from police uh, in various parts of the country and, and our responses to those uh, uh, revelations um, and to understand what that is. Police chiefs want to know that. That's kind of important to them. Uh, it's a big liability. And it's an insider threat issue because actually anti-government, right-wing, anti-authority groups are the groups that most often target the police and actually set up ambushes for the police and specifically see the police as an enemy that they want to engage with. So um, so I think that's um, uh, also uh, important to know. I mean, it's a recognized thing. Um, again, not new, but the difference between a lot of the historical context that I'm talking about, military police, past uh, ideological driven, ideologically driven violence, is um, it's, it's available to people now in not in a dark basement or not in a, uh, uh, you know, a yurt somewhere or wherever, I don't know where the weather or the underground hung out. Um, uh, 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 it's available to them in the comfort of their own home through the device that we're using right now, right? And so fraud is not new, extremism is not new, conspiracies aren't new, cults aren't new. None of these things are new. We know a lot about the human behavior in person with these things there's been a lot of study historically the new variable is really the inundation of information through machines and systems that are designed to create an actual physical addictive response in their use and and how um and how uh and how those things are designed to give you what raises your temperature and, and causes you to engage more with those devices and those websites that are trying to sell you advertising. And, and, um, and, and, and nobody's doing a, there's been some documentaries and stuff. Nobody's doing a ton of scientific research in that area, in part because the data are only available from private companies and they're not going to share. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> sorry, it was a lot of things from trying to put together all your really great talks. Uh, um, but I, I think those are consequential from my perspective. So thanks again, sorry. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, Felicia. Thanks, Laura, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I wanna build off 
what we were just saying, and uh, which is you know, the ideology kind of seeming to flip or shift um, in alignment with keeping power. Uh, and part of what I was thinking, and Darren, I was thinking about it when you were talking, was you know the focus was on the susceptibility of folks in terms of conspiracy theories. Part of what I was actually thinking about was the perpetrator of this or perpetrators of this uh, and wondering about uh, either what they got out of it, power, um, but what else motivated them to do that, you know, to engage in this behavior in the first place, what puts a position, a person in the position to, to do this, whether it's, you know, particularly, I guess, when it's uh, to large masses of folks. Uh, and so I don't have an answer for that, but that's like, that's where my brain went, uh, was be, trying to be really curious about that. And then that tied to, to what Todd was talking about. Um, and I can remember when I was in my doc program, um, one of the things that we were looking at when we were looking at personality profiles and studying personality tests was um, the similar, there were, have been studies around the similarities between you know, police officers and offenders and how those personality tests match up. And so when Todd was talking, I was actually wondering if anyone has looked at personality profiles of extremists and military folks. And I just, I have no idea. Like I just, it was just something that like all this and I was like, I, you know, and I, I'm the clinician here. I'm not the researcher <laughs> and scholar here. And so um, it would be curious to hear from folks, uh, you know, if that's something that, you know, people have looked at uh, at all, uh, and and what we learn from that in terms of seeing, as I understood it, um, particularly with veterans, Todd, if I understood what you were saying correctly, um, you know, the increase in participation in these kinds of movements. And then I have one other thought. Um, uh, did you want me to answer that? Um, I'm not aware of any research looking at personality characteristics. Um, okay. Though, honestly, it wouldn't be that difficult of research to do. There's various um, online tools to measure the big five uh, based on just Twitter histories with reasonable accuracy. There is another personality profile that looks at proclivity to violence, but I'm trying to remember the name mm -hmm. of it. Um, uh, but, um, you know, apply that to, to army, Navy, air force, yeah. Marine Reddit profiles. Yeah. I, I, it was just be really interesting. All y'all, this and I had this, you know, remembering, you know, what 20 or 25 years ago, however long I would go, I was in school, um, you know, like reading those articles and those studies and just being fascinated by that. And it was, a lot of it was around, I mean, there are a lot of them, but, um, I particularly remember one about the MMPI. Uh, and those profiles mm -hmm. uh, being really similar. Uh, and so that's, you know, when you were talking, that's I was just like, I would just, that'd be just so curious to me. Um, so, well, I'd love to give MMPI to, uh, to a bunch of extremists. Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> that, would be, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> I, I... The, the, a lot of the things that motivate people to join gangs or terrorist organizations are the same types of things that the military recruits on and and you know get people to join the military that or other what some may argue are not but i would say are pro-social organizations right it's uh you can that's that's part of my that why i don't think the ideology is nearly as important as the cognitive and behavioral outcomes right mm -hmm. yeah yeah. Along those lines, I know there's been psychological research that looks at um, people who have sadistic ten tendencies, mm, and, and they tend to go toward jobs that, and this is not saying that people in those jobs are sadistic, but they tend to go to jobs where they get the opportunity to act out hostile behavior. That's interesting. And so, that's and that's aligned with Rick's comment earlier about ideology not mattering, which right. is a really criminal justice yep. approach to <laughs> stop the bad behavior. And... <laughs> Yeah, I'm found out. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> my my last comment was, you know, thinking about what Marilyn was talking about, and you know, Marilyn, one of the things that you were really focusing, particularly at the end, was preserving democracy. And I just wanted to share with folks a little bit about what is happening here in Michigan. That's very real, you know. And so um, I serve in the legislature with folks who are election deniers. Uh, right now, that is happening. 
Uh, and, um, you know, so much so that uh, there are some folks who are election deniers. You know, we had a group of uh, fake electors trying to disrupt Michigan's meeting of our electoral college. Uh, and uh, state representative, there at least one that I know of, potentially two, were present to try and be part of that disruption. Uh, you know, so folks who I again who I serve with right now, um, and and I do also know in talking with my colleagues, and Marilyn, you talked about how 60% of folks are going to be faced with uh, you know the choice on their ballot with a potential person who is an election denier, you know, in a couple of weeks here or right now. I mean, like for folks are voting right now in Michigan. Um, and that is certainly true. I mean, I talked with some of my colleagues after the primary, um, uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And, um, you know, when I was in those conversations, there was um, a level of dismay uh, around what was happening in their party uh, and trying to figure out how to navigate that, um, you know, because they, you know, there was this stuckness uh, around you know, what do we do here uh, in terms of uh, calling out uh, and, you know, not feeling like that person who won the primary uh, is, they share the same values, but also I think wanting to be able to stay in power here in Michigan uh, and to stay in power, you need numbers, right? Uh, and so I think, you know, so there's a, a real struggle right now and we literally are facing that. So what you were saying Marilyn, really resonated with me as I, you know, as I serve every day here and, you know, I'm in the midst of, um, you know, a campaign and campaign statewide uh, to, to shift uh, the, the power here in our state. I'll, I'll just add to that, that um, I know, you know, ADL is working with a number of other organizations um, and we have local offices around the country, 25 local offices to um, both, you know, promote, a, you know, protect elections in, in certain, in various ways, but also to be on the watch for any kind of um, extremist action that we see surrounding the elections uh, to be able to act quickly on it. And um, I know that this is a concern of so many different um, organizations that are, that are working on this issue of you know, election integrity and, 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 and election and voting. So um, I think we are, I, I keep saying to people, we need a plan day of and day after, you know, so. Thank you both. Um, Georges. You know, one of the interesting things from a societal perspective is that there's this general belief that the generations behind mine, um, my grandparents, my generation, aren't joiners. There are people that don't join groups. They tend to be loners. They tend to engage um, society quite differently, um, more in an a la carte manner. Um, you know, and what's, what's fascinating about the discussion we're having right now is that it really is the opposite discussion. These are clearly people that find uh, joining the need to join a group and they appear to search for the group which meets their needs. Now, it may mean that they're searching for the group that meets their needs at the moment, which may be even more interesting and, and makes it much more difficult to track. But I guess that, that's one of the questions that I have. Um, do we know enough about the um, tribal society, the tribal nature of these groups, of people that join these uh, various groups do they join and do they stick? Do they go in and out? Do they migrate from group to group? As, as the youth today do with jobs and um, organizations and associations, um, you know, very different. I mean, kids today don't, don't, don't join the Boy Scouts. Um, you know, they don't, they don't become a Cub Scout and then become a Boy Scout uh, and then become a Scout Master. Those days are over. Does anyone want to chime in on that? That is a, um, it, it's interesting, although I know the Girl Scouts are active here in Ohio. So I don't know if the days are entirely over. I think Ohio is different. 
<laughs> well, I think I think people people th these entities still exist, right? Because parents bring kids in, they you know they they join the soccer team, they you know they they join sports teams, but but I think in general, um, the the migratory behavior of of individuals through groups, um, I, I say that to say that maybe this is if you can identify folks that have this need to join groups, that might turn out to be a, um, uh, a factor that's helpful. Um, you know, not, not wanting to join a group may turn out to be a protective factor. It's a scale, I think, right? So um, it's not a on off, join a group, not join a group, or a particular type of group. I think that there is uh, some um, what are commonly accepted, and Felicia would know more about this than me, some commonly accepted parts of what are considered human needs yeah. that have to do with social interaction at different levels of different types and different uh, ways. And if you don't have that at all, um, you're probably diagnosable with a number of disorders. But, um, uh, uh, but there also, are and and again this is only what i've seen in literature i haven't seen measurements of changes in in joining behavior and that, that's a really interesting um uh, uh large scale trend to think about but uh the 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 thing that that doesn't change is is some level of fundamental need. There's there's an Australian sociologist that works with the military there and also studies terrorism stuff. And I and not for the life of me, I can't remember his name. It drives me crazy. Uh, I was just trying to look it up, mm -hmm. and he and I were chatting a few years ago, and he said, "Oh yeah, it's the boy's own adventure, right? It's write your own adventure kind of thing." And and people, it's the, it's, um, it was a Robert Pape has written about the Star Wars narrative, right? Uh, the, um, it's the rebellion and me against the world, but I also get to belong to this really exclusive group and we're the people that are in the know. And, 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 uh, and, and as far as past generations go, I don't know. I, 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 I hear biographies all the time about people that fought in World War II and did amazingly heroic things. And then they came back to the United States and drove a taxi for the rest of their life. Right. <laughs> but that's always seemed odd to me. Right. You, you're part of this big thing. And then then you become, you know, you take your place in society and do a relatively what I might consider to be a mundane job. So um, so I, I, I think those are really interesting questions that that would be informative, um, but I'm, I'm not sure that they're quite that clear cut. Esther? Esther, you're unmuted, but for some reason we can't hear you. Try turning, muting and unmuting again. No. Is she muted by the host, Laura? Like folks. Oh, let work? me check. No, she's unmuted by the host. Is your is your headset plugged in? Why don't you try unplugging your headset and talking to the computer? Oh, no. Sorry. Could could you write in the chat and we'll read it? And while she's writing, um, Felicia? I just wanted to build on what Georges was saying uh, about kind of, you know, we're past errors, not joiners. And it, this kind of is an opposite thought. And I'd love to just hear what folks think, but um, particularly in terms of what we're talking about and uh, with the rise in participation in these groups, um, you know, for you know, the last hundred years or so we had, you know, the Great Depression, World War One, Great Depression, World War II, Vietnam. We've had other wars since then, um, but at least, you know, I didn't, obviously I didn't get to live through those. But it seems in the reporting of them that there was a, a national kind of surge around uh, engagement uh, around those. And my generation, I feel like we have not um, we have not had anything like that. 
um, to that level, to that scope. Certainly there have been wars, but not to the level and scope of you know, world wars, things like that. Uh, and I wonder about the absence of that, thinking psychologically that one of the things that joins us is you know, a common goal uh, and a, a, you know, a common theme. Uh, and with, in the absence of that nationally, um, does that mean then that there's a proliferation in these kind of extremist groups in that absence? I, you know, I have no idea, but when you were talking, George, I, that just, that came to me. Yeah, the, I mean, we the, can't la hear you, Laura. the lack of a national identity um, and a goal is, 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 is fascinating um, because yeah, we I'm have often, a divided nation now. I'm often heard to say we should maybe focus a little bit less on the things that make us really different from one another and a little bit more on the things that make us the same. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, so I was, I was actually going to ask Ashley to read her comment and, and I will, but, but there was a comment that came in from, um, an attendee, um, Barbara Bright, that I, I think is actually pr pretty important because what we haven't talked about today or yesterday is Fox News. Um, and so will someone discuss Fox News in that influence? And then Barbara's 93 year old mother lives in a homebound bubble and only watches this. And, and I'm sure that there are hundreds of thousands of, of stories or, that are very similar. Um, well, there's no question that Fox News creates a national identity. I mean, they, they have the largest viewership in the country. And um, I can tell you, as I travel around the country, the what I, what I what I see on TV in Maryland and DC and Virginia and um, um, and, and in traditional blue states uh, are very different than what I see when I'm traveling um, in Middle America um, and in the South. Um, in fact, um, you know Fox News is predominant, and um, when you pick up the newspaper, um, what's on the front page is very different. What's in the the inner page? So, yeah, it. it um, people's view of reality and what is most important is driven a lot by what they see. And then you're right, if, if grandma, all, all grandma sees is, uh, um, uh, the, you know, the, the news and they're all giving one view, um, that becomes reality. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, um, I will add that, um, you know, both, both social media and, and also, <laughs> Fox News, um, you know, has played such a huge role in a lot of what we're talking about today in terms of people um, having certain viewpoints and maybe feeling to be a member of a certain group. But Tucker Carlson, uh, as an example, who's someone I monitor uh, quite a bit, he's one of the most popular, um, you know, uh, folks, I don't want to call him a journalist, but folks on Fox News, who every day is promoting um, at this point, white nationalist views, like the Great Replacement, but also others. And because he has such a huge uh, viewership, I think it it does, you know, create um, a situation where, uh, again, this this normalization of these extremist views is is becoming more commonplace. And and it's not just you know a few viewers; it's millions of viewers. This is someone who has tremendous sway over people. Um, and so I, you know, I think it's, it's very important to mention that and that there's, and it doesn't, of course, it's, you know, there's Sean Hannity, there's, there are others who have very large viewerships who, um, who have been participating in this conspiracy mongering as well. Um, and not beyond the great replacement, um, uh, bringing on guests like every day that promulgate election fraud and, and many other conspiracies. So I, I think it's really important to talk about that. Thank you. Um, as as um, you, I, I don't know if the attendees are aware of this, but we've asked all of the participants, the, the panelists, as well as the responders to turn on their cameras. And we're just sliding into panel four where, where we um, continue our conversation um, with an ear and eye toward um, what can we do about this? Um, in the spirit of that, I'm also keeping an eye on the chat um, and the Q&A. Um, and there was a request to hear from Merrill to talk about Fox News and the storytelling in terms of folklore. Um, Merrill, I, I have a feeling you've thought about this. Well, I thought a little Sorry, bit about I put you on the spot with that one. No, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this is the spot. 
um, we're here to be on the spot. Um, the I've thought a little bit about this, but it's, uh, um, and I don't want to be uh, pedantic about this, but it's um, uh, Fox News is mass channel as opposed to uh, the informal channel. So folks talk less about it, but are some of the narratives uh, that are promulgated in this official channel traditional narratives? Absolutely. And some of them are these uh, quite dangerous, harmful narratives. Uh, what's happening with the move of um, those things from, on the one hand, the informal, and the other hand, it is related from the fringe um, into the official, um, is that there's an imprimatur that the, sorry, into the mass, and and there's there's an, there's an official um, uh, uh, sort of esque. It's a little bit of a blended channel because uh, it's the news. Um, uh, is that th these these narratives then get a certain premature uh, because news as a genre is actually related to legendary, but it it news uh, is um, can also be story, but it's story that's framed as not a narrative, but as information that is true and is pressing that you should know. It's and I mean, the, the new the new part of news is like this is it's breaking, uh, and you need to know it. Um, so it doesn't flag itself as this is a story that's going around. Um, it may take a story that is going around and then uh, kind of reskin it uh, as um, uh, pressing information that is true that you need. And then once that happens, um, it is uh, it may be hard to pull it back into like mm, that is that is a a story that is under debate and actually. Um, this is the problem with with coming back with with facts. Those facts may not matter. Uh, to people, because the story may punch all sorts of buttons uh, that um, that have already been uh, spoken about by other people in very capable ways. Does that help? Yes, yes. Um, Ashley, you had put a comment in the chat related to groups, the, the question that came up earlier about groups. And, and I, I do think that it's um, important to to intertwine the the new way that we communicate each other with the advancement of technology with this idea of group joining. Well, so um, my comment, which is about how digital practice and culture shifts the nature of, of relationality in groups and, and social relations and affinities, research shows that people experience on and offline life as coextensive as as one thing, and it's been showing that for more than twenty years. So we talk about them as if they are separate for a variety of reasons that have to do with our goals and missions and how we do work and how law works, right? I've, I've written about this disrupting the digital divide because particularly what we would call digital natives are youth that Georges was talking about and why they seem to move between things, right? Doesn't mean that they don't actually have affinities with those things, right? It's a function of how they view the world differently through technology. They've had this technology since they were babies. Right, they've engaged with this technology since they were babies, so they can participate in things and and think you know friendships are you know you ask a kid today you have a thousand followers they think they have a thousand friends right that's not what we would call a friend, but it, it it's a different way of of social affinity. So you have this environment that takes social groupings and makes them not in person, it makes them asynchronous, not at the same time, right? You can talk to someone via email but, or chat board or whatever in completely different times. And it's still a conversation. And that, so that changes the sense of belongingness and affinity, right? So one of the arguments I make around extremism is that like online radicalization as like a solo thing is, is I find that problematic, right? It's not necessarily lone radicalization because people are in a community. They're just not in a synchronous in-person community. Right? So just because they read a Reddit post with a manifesto or a discussion thread that's older, doesn't mean they don't feel like there's a community around them when they're being engaged. It doesn't, it feels social. So part of what I was saying yesterday, and it was a very small part, is these technologies allow for partial participation and often anonymous partial participation, which means I don't have to sign up to the KKK. I don't have to buy a robe and a hood. I don't have to go to the meeting and I can still be part of the KKK. I can still participate in the hate. I can still spread it. And that's a different thing that our laws, our regulatory structures, 
don't have the capacity to deal with non-hierarchical group structure, well, if you take Autumn Waffen and the associated channels and accelerationist groupings, I just did a study on this last year at Swansea, if you take those groups, those are decentralized distributed networks, right, which work as much as possible towards Louis Beam's idea of leaderless resistance, of non-hierarchy, which disrupts the ability of law enforcement to then respond to those groups. So it's a strategic thing as, that is aligned with a technological capacity. And so we have to think differently about how groupings and communities work, especially for a lot of the target populations for radicalization and recruitment, which are young, often men. At least that's my soapbox. So, so we've done a lot of raising problems over the last couple of days. Um, and, 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 you know, it can be very overwhelming. But oftentimes with problems, there are solutions. Although <laughs> we heard from Merrill that as we try to push back using, you know, addressing some of these distorted ideas with, with, with reason or humor or whatever, we're perpetuating some of these ideas. Um, has anyone given some thought? Or I, this is, I know, one of the questions that came up yesterday. Um, and, and I don't have the exact words. They're on my computer somewhere, but but I'm going to look at all of you. Um, is, is there has anyone given any thought to to a way to countering some of these narratives or a, a way to use pro-social messaging and that that would integrate de democratic ideals? Because that that's what I'm hearing. Both like when we listen to what's happening in Hungary and Brazil and you know, in other countries and here and in Michigan and in Ohio, our democracy is a threat. Um, so, so please, if you have ideas, I know Felicia put her hand up or Meryl has her hand up and then TM. So I had a, a small scale um, uh, idea just now really about uh, messaging and the problem with uh, pushing back with facts um, that is totally uh, uh, informed by uh, folklore, there's pushing back with facts is the equivalent of saying is not. Um, and a lot of what is going on is uh, uh, sort of, and I don't, I don't want to uh, make light of it by saying that this is uh, playground shouting back and forth. Playground shouting back and forth is like a real folklore genre and adults do it too. And it's, it's called verbal dueling. Uh, and is not uh, only gets you is too, and it doesn't get you very far. It's always a weak move. Um, you know instinctively because you've had this conversation on the um, playground, uh, the stronger move is, yeah, well, and then coming with something else. Um, and so when I see arguments happening about uh, CRT, it's like they're teaching CRT in the classroom. No, we're not, that's not CRT. That's always a weak move. Uh, and maybe some more messaging um, needs to take into account that genre that we're operating in um, and frame things more like, yeah, well, if you call people not using uh, slurs, CRT, why are you so invested in people using slurs? That, that is a move that would be recognized on the playground um, as uh, fitting into the genre in an effective way. That, that's really helpful. You know, I, I, as an aside, one of the reasons I wanted to come to OSU is that the Merchant Center had a folklorist, um, which I thought was awesome. It's, it's International Security Studies, who's now the director. Um, so TM, you chimed in next. Well, uh, in, in my, I'm working in two different directions. For one, I'm a researcher, and for the other, on the other side, I'm also a practitioner. I work really out there, working with extremists, former extremists, but also with a lot of students. Uh, work with a lot in the community where individuals coming up with these problems and asking me how to tackle this. So we have two different approaches. And then many people want to know the one solution for everything. How can we convince all of them right now, the best on Facebook when we see it? The problem is, of course, social media has a certain dynamic that makes it really, really hard. Um, it's the best if we know these. I always encourage people, if you don't know these people, don't engage. The more you engage, the more traction it will get because the social media has this dynamic with instant gratification with their friends versus your friends and everybody's chiming in and both sides are getting this instant gratification which pushes the whole thing 
And all you have is an argument at the end where both sides are standing up and turn their back, backs on each other and leave. That for the most part don't lead anywhere. So I encourage everybody, if you have people that you don't know on social media, don't engage. Leave it to the people who know them. So focus on the people you know. Take them away from, from social media. Take them to Starbucks or elsewhere. Fortunately, COVID allows us now that we can meet in person again. So take them to the face-to-face, one-to-one conversation. They will behave completely different. Things they would say on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, wherever. They would never say in your face because they don't have the backing from their peers, the peer pressure, and, and they don't have the instant gratification if they call you out as well. So this all is missing. They're much more open. And next thing is also encourage everybody, how does a conversation like this work? Because people tell me, TM, I've tried this. I've sat down, I tried to talk sense into them, it didn't work. And what I say here, and this is my approach that I saw that works, especially with hardcore extremists. And it works with hardcore extremists, it works with everybody. And a lot of students have taken up this approach as well at universities and high schools. Um, there's two problems with this already. I, I tried to talk sense into them, that's the first problem. Imagine you're in a relationship, spouse to spouse, and you have an argument. You try to talk sense into your spouse. Where will this lead to? And we all know the answer. Why do we try the same thing that we know that doesn't work in a relationship at home? Why do we try the same thing that doesn't work with strangers? It's absurd. We need to lower our guards. We need to also listen to them because they're human beings. And it's hard. Somebody that you don't like to love those people, to see them as human beings, because we dehumanize all these people as well. And this is what a lot of people don't consider, how we dehumanize them. And and I, every, I guarantee everybody here has done it, saw it on Facebook and called, called some of these people with some slur word or some nice mock name or nickname that we maybe shouldn't have. We don't put it out as much, uh, but it happens. And we're all, I guarantee, we're all guilty of that. And we go to bed tonight. I want everybody to, do, to, to think about the last couple of months when we've done it the last time. We all will catch ourselves that we've done it. No, we need to see those people as people, human beings that once have been normal. See them like that and, and tell them, understand, try. Hey, I want to understand where you're coming from. And maybe look at the commonalities because there's something you have in common. Often it's neighbors. Look at them, look at the commonalities there and, and, and seek for the one thing of common ground you can find. And let me give you one example and then I will chime out here uh, with that. Um, I talked to somebody and the biggest thing was abortion. That's one of the red buttons, right? Right and the left. And it was a mother and, 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 her, and her kids or one of the kids at least. And she was a liberal and he was more like the father, a little bit right, little far right wing. And he called her a baby killer. He called her a lip tart and it went back and forth. He 18 and his mother, you know, and she didn't know where to go. And I said, look, instead, it will lead nowhere if you stay on this level of conversation. I asked him, her, have you ever told your son, I asked her, do you like abortions? And I guarantee nobody on this planet likes abortions. No one, of course, nobody wants an abortion. So I'm like, oh, let's get pregnant and kill a baby. I mean, this is absurd what some people think, like Democrats are waking up with the lust of killing babies. You know, we need to make sure they understand. And they told her, make sure your son understands that you both actually don't like abortions. You just have your social outputs. How you tackle this problem is a different one, right? Why don't you try to work together or talk about a society, a concept of society where abortions would be a, no, a non-brainer, where, where it would not be necessary in the first place. And all of a sudden, oh, well, this works. So she tried that and they found common ground there. And he realized, actually, we're on the same page. Our social outputs here, how we tackle this is completely different. And therefore, the social actions. And this is the dangerous part. And I believe it's yesterday somebody said it. The U.S. was founded by extremists, by radicals that came from Europe. I don't know who it was, but it's it's really true. And this is until today. I mean, this, this country, this is how it works. So we have to talk about uh, when does a, 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 the social output become so extreme that it may become violent. And this is where we have to, 
And if we talk, and everybody can think whatever they want, for example, about abortion in this case, but talk, but talk about the social output, how you tackle that and agree, you're on the same side action. All of a sudden, you don't have to agree to disagree. You can agree to agree because we have common ground. And this is what we have to do. When we talk to these people, don't talk sense into them, don't try. And it also doesn't work once. It has to be repetitive. Again and again, take on one, not 10. Don't try to change the whole world. It won't work. Tackle one by one, sit down repetitive, lower your guards, show them respect and dignity as human beings. And as you show them their own humanity, they will accept you as a human being and the humanity. And all of a sudden, they lower their guards too. And all the Trumpsters and Liptots and baby killers and Trumpsters, all these things are gone. And you have two human beings having a conversation. So this is how, how we tackle that. Thank you, TM. This is really helpful. And um, and we're saving transcripts of all of this too, um, so, so you know. Um, Adrian. So in the chat, Ashley and Merrill have been talking about how this resonates with, like that TM is saying sort of the same things you'd say about heuristic persuasion, about sort of building communities of trust to, um, to allow people to find common ground. For me, it resonated as, oh, this is really good. What Ella, what Ella Baker called spade work, right? Sort of like on the ground organizing in social movements so that you do the small thing so that you get to a point where you can define a goal and do do the work together. But that's not what I was going to say. That was just me riffing off of the chat. What I was going to say, well, one, Meryl, my version of my preferred um, verbal duel dueling was always, I know you are, but what am I? Which also doesn't get you very far, um, but boy, did I ever use it a lot. Um, and that my kind of small scale intervention when I think about um, these things, because I spend so much time in the classroom, um, and like trying to get students to think hard about how the words that they use produce the concepts that they traffic in, it's to kind of disrupt these lazy, e easy narratives that are the shorthands that people deploy to entrench themselves in their positions. So, um, you know, when people are basically like, I think I said in the in the chat for the one, both sides do it. Well, it's like, okay, who are our sides? What is the it? If we're going to talk about, so I've recently utterly rejected the language of polarization, which I find exasperating and infuriating because it posits that there are two equal and opposite poles, right? That they somehow have the same weight um, or what have you when really what we've seen is the American political spectrum, if we, again, thinking like a historian, compare it to say the 1880s or even the 1910s, an American political spectrum that has shifted strongly to the right, where we begin in the center and move right. And somehow the left side of the center has come to be framed as the far left in our political parlance, in part because we don't actually think about the way that sort of, you know, politics look elsewhere, we being Americans in this case, right? So I push my students on that, like, rather than give me liberal and conservative, which are shorthands by which y'all all mean different things and you don't even know it. Let's talk specifically about the particular things that you believe in or the particular sort of issues that motivate you. When we talk about, I don't know, even kind of like racial identities and my students want to be like us and them depending on who they're talking about i'm like who is your we and what is your affiliation like what are different ways that you can speak that will convey to people what you mean but don't immediately like create i don't even know what you'd call them sort of structures of understanding in their head so that you don't realize they're they're not hearing what you're saying right so part of this is being very thoughtful specific and deliberate about language as a way to kind of open up vision. Thank you so much. Um, that's really, really helpful. And again, grateful for the transcript. Todd? Hi. So if the question's about like, how do you counter this? Um, uh, I mean, I, I think, 
There's, a th I'll sort of try and give a, a big overview on, on how I think about the policy issue here. Um, one, what TM said is, I mean, right on. Um, uh, individual engagement um, to help pull people out um, uh, and working at it from a position of empathy rather than attacks or assaults um, is definitely the way to go. I think I think the challenge is, is how do we scale this up? Um, uh, uh, so I think that that's you know in my mind that's that's a key challenge. That's a key question mark is how do you scale this up? And there are organizations that are out there that do this work. I know TM is involved in some of this, and there are other organizations like Parents for Peace, Life Against Hate, um, uh, and 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 they're doing great work. Um, but you know, um, uh, but is there a way to use the online sector to, to help bring this up more? Um, there another angle to the counter extremist angle is maybe um, a mental health mental health treatment. It sort of goes to the public health model. Um, there's been interesting research uh, from the organization of Moonshot that shows that there's a relationship between people who have these ideologies and their desire for um, uh, mental health treatment. Um, they're much more likely to call a mental health line than, than, than those who are not afflicted with these sort of right-wing extremist ideologies. Um, uh, we also know that there's large high rates of mental health issues amidst these populations as well. So I think that provides another trajectory to, to maybe scale up um, uh, interventions. Uh, and then of course, there's this whole like disinformation angle to it, right? I mean, dis disinformation is uniquely tied up with the uh, types of extremism that we're seeing in the United States today. Um, and that brings in a whole bunch of relevant policies, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, corrections. I, I get it that uh, that saying, but um, when someone makes an argument, you say not that, but this is not ideal, but there is data that suggests that on a, on a, uh, on a large level, those have, those interventions do have moderate impact to do corrections. Um, fact checking uh, does work on some level. Um, media literacy interventions, there's inoculation interventions that we know uh, works. Google just tested one um, as well. Uh, so um, obviously the platforms have to be involved in this. There's all sorts of things that they have to do, uh, obviously starting with the algorithms um, and there's probably a need for transparency legislation. Um, so anyway, it's a it, there's a lot, I feel like there's just, from a policy angle, there's just a lot of items on the plate that need to be addressed in some sort of synchronized way. Um, it's sort of an all hands on deck effort, but yeah, thanks. Todd, thanks for not saying whole of society. I'm, everybody's tired of hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, can actually, I just- Actually, Rick yep. Esther had her hand up. Oh, I'm so um, sorry, so sorry. Yep. That, that, that's okay, um, but I, I'll take note on your hand. Esther, oh, oh no, Esther, you're, you're, we're unable to hear you again. Uh, all right, Esther, please write in the chat this time, and um, Rick, I'll let you go. Thanks. So, you know, I, I think um, there are lots of good historical examples of uh, large, very profitable parts of private industry in the United States that um, uh, have used specific tactics to delay regulation, right, in the past. And, and it's always the same story. They get sued and bad things happen and eventually, you know, but but one of the tactics that, that they have used historically, and I think about the tobacco industry, the oil and gas industry, these, these types of things, right, is they'll fund a bunch of research centers and a bunch of research where they're controlling the narrative of what right. questions are asked. Right <laughs> to to try to really dissociate themselves and move themselves away from having to own any part of the problem while they make you know gajillions of dollars, and um, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the department at this point. This is my personal two cents on this. Uh, and and so if you look at the research centers that tobacco companies set up in the 50s and 60s, and the and the and the oil companies in the 70s and 80s to refute climate change, that these types of things, um, uh, that's exactly what uh, the big tech companies are doing now, 
while also saying we're not the problem, these small companies are the problem, leave us alone, right? Um, but, but as Todd said, there's no transparency. We don't know what goes into the secret sauce that gets people to constantly be hammered with ever so slightly more extreme stuff. And I don't care whether it's right, left, or the fluffiness of a kitten that gets you engaged. That's what you're going to get, right? And, and that's fundamentally, right, how these things work. So because engagement is how they make money. That's how the advertisers pay them. So, um, so, uh, and, and there's really been no move. There's been some discussion or regulation. There's been some pressure put on behind the scenes that I'm aware of, but there's no move to make data available to completely independent objective research that would allow people to quantify and understand the causal relationship of exactly those algorithms and 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 they will do everything i i personally think that they'll do everything they possibly can to delay that for as long as they can because it's their business model and, and i'm not saying oh evil of course it's just it's it's just their business model they make a lot of money it matters to their shareholders right thanks rick um i'm gonna read esther's comment um so this this therapeutical approach is very useful. We use here, meaning here in Brazil, we use uh, volunteers with similar live experiences to rebound and groups of psychoanalysts to work with the delirium or to work the delirium. Of course, we have the scale problem, but there's there are ways to scale up evolving institutions in the in this work of listening. Um, and this this is in response to some of the things that TM said. I'm I'm pretty sure so you can nod, Esther. Yeah. So so yeah, I I think I think that a lot of what has been said and is being said is is um, really helpful because um, I I as sticking my foot in even though I don't have my hand up is that I I agree that 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 we can do things on an individual level and and work on how to scale this up. Um, the problem of advertisers making money <laughs> is, is one that that is a little bit mind blowing. Um, and I'm gonna raise another problem shortly that, that we've talked about or that has been implied, but the first I'd like to hear from Todd again. Yeah, it's just a random thought that came from, from, from Rick's uh, comments. Um, uh, there's new re interesting research out that suggests from Amsterdam that suggests that um, echo chambers are not a reason that we're seeing a polarized society, but um, it's it's actually quite the opposite. There's all sorts of online engagements between the left and right online. The nature of those engagements, however, are vitriolic um, and seem to be producing a lot of the political polarization that you're seeing online. Um, which in my mind suggests an alternative, another sort of way to, to think about interventions is how to, how to help those on the left and right um, engage with each other in constructive ways and not um, see differences of opinion online as either reasons to attack or, or reasons to hate. Over. Thanks, Todd. Rick? Yeah, Todd, that's a that's good. Uh, um, uh, and there's earlier work that comports with that from Israel. And what's really interesting is confronting somebody with facts or an opposite viewpoint tends to push them further out on the spectrum they were traveling on already. Um, or giving them just things that are a little bit more extreme than they are now will more slowly pull them in that direction. Uh, but the way you push people back towards a more moderate condition is to present them with an argument or information that is far more extreme in the same direction as their current beliefs. And that causes people to back off. Now, how do we use that information? <laughs> I don't think we're going to go out. And, and I can tell you now, the government's not going to go out there and publish rhetoric that's even more extreme than what we're trying to prevent in the hopes that we're going to make people back off regardless of the amount of evidence for that but at an individual level i do think that understanding some of that psychological work is very important 
and I've anecdotally, I've seen it happen with people. My, my, we all, we all have these people have written about them. My, my father-in-law, right. 80 some years old Fox news and all that jazz. He deleted Facebook from his phone right before the last election, when he started getting memes um, encouraging that all anyone who's a Democrat should be uh, lynched. And, and that's what made him delete Facebook from his phone. Right. It was well, he was pretty extreme and it was a more extreme than he was willing to be. Thanks, Ray. Um, George's. Yeah, we do know a couple of things. We do know that, that there are a small group of people can have an outside influence. So we know that there's about 12 groups, 12 individuals who are, are at the core of most of the vaccine misinformation that we see. So just know that that the um, the magnification aspect of even a few individuals in cyberspace plays an outside role. The second thing, of course, we also know is that we have people who, for a variety of reasons, um, spend their time creating um, discont um, discontent. Um, some great studies um, out of uh, folks at George Washington University's um, folks actually published in the American Journal of Public Health about two and a half, three years ago which looked at the um, number of groups that were engaging in both pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, pro-gun, anti-gun debates, but the goal was to create um, conflict. Uh, and that's all they did all day was, was get, it, it, you know, inter interact in those groups to actually create the conflict. So in some ways, the conflict is, is may not really be real, um, or at least not at the same level that we think it is in some of these um, conversations. And, and by the way, they use that information. Part of the reason is that is a particular one of the reasons the Russians do it is to um, learn how humans behave. So then they can go back and influence um, um, other conversations for political reasons. So I'm really actually doing a scientific study. Thanks. The Russian bots that have come in and, and to, to make our conversations even more hostile. Felicia. Uh, Todd, what Todd was just saying in terms of kind of the political discourse, you know, as part of what I was trying to, to talk about yesterday uh, when I was thinking about Merrill's comments was you know, the use of social media uh, in to replace face-to-face -face conversations and the, the decrease in interpersonal relationship and skills and conflict management. Uh, and I have seen this um, before I was a legislator and working you know, as a therapist full time. And I can tell you in talking with um, you know, adolescents and young adults, we literally had to do that skill building on practicing talking to, to other folks um, because the, so much of the, the communication was through um, their phone. And even though they were used to that, um, there, there wasn't the development of conflict management or the, um, they didn't have, or the tools were limited um, in terms of being able to navigate that. And I feel like um, as folks in older generations have started to really take that on more and more, it is easier to just put out how you feel uh, without regard for other folks and rather than having a serious discourse about something um, because it becomes, I feel like number one, it becomes so shortened. So again, whatever that Twitter limit is. Um, so it becomes what's the most salacious thing that gets said um, uh, and gets picked up. Um, but also I don't believe then the goal has shifted from dialogue and understanding to the I'm right, you're wrong. Thank you, Felicia. Adrian. So I have a, I mean, I have a question and it's, so we're thinking a lot about kind of people and their thinking and how, how we get people to think instead of scream or think instead of react. And there's some part of me, you know, who's still very like, it's about structures and institutions. And so there's some part of me that's been sitting in this conversation being like, you know, it's it 
still comes back on some level to the vote and access to the vote and expanding and protecting that access and protecting um, these these democratic practices and norms that we have been startled to learn have only been norms and we've just been working with them because people work with them. But this conversation, like I'm, I'm, you know, I've always thought the vote is not adequate, but it's a necessary precondition for um, meaningful political practice. But this conversation is also about how people who are are kind of steeped in in distorted mindsets, like on some level, giving them access to the vote is not going to fix the problem if they're still deeply embedded in misinformation and extremism. And so I guess I'm asking for help to think about both, one, the practical thing, what do we do about securing and expanding the franchise for as many people as possible, but also how does the conversation that we've had so far complicate my sense that that is a helpful solution? Does that question make sense to y'all? Yes, and, and given that, that the question was raised before we move on to Darren, um, does anyone want to respond to Adrian's um, question? Ms. If we, oh, Alicia. Adrian, I don't know if this is what you're looking for. Again, I come for, you know, to this from a very practical standpoint rather than steeped in the research as all of you are. So if this is not what you're looking for, um, just <laughs> say so. Um, but you know, I literally stood on the floor where we had almost three dozen uh, laws that were put in front of us and we had to vote on that stymied the vote, right? That stymied, literally you know, like had to vote no on those. And so we are, you know, as a representative, um, you know, constantly trying to, again, and the Democrats in Michigan are not in power in either chamber. We have, you know, the governor, um, we have a you know, stop gap so that when it gets to her desk, she can veto those, thank goodness. Um, because otherwise we would be in a world of hurt. We really would. And when we try and put out our values and our voting rights packages, they don't go anywhere because we're not in positions to be able to move them along the legislative process. Uh, and so in a very practical way, we play defense a lot. And think, like I said, thank goodness we have the governor uh, to do that. Um, but that's also why, again, as you know, one person is part of one chamber, uh, you know, I'm literally going around the state because my seat is safer, knocking for other candidates to have these di the, these discussions and these conversations about democracy, about these other things, about people's access and right to vote and um, what that means what, as we vote in Lansing um, so that the, the power dynamic shifts so that we can have these um, measures in place rather than fighting against these alternative ones. Thank you, Felicia. Um, I, I'm going to take the prerogative as, as facilitator here to say that one of the things that I've been wanting to bring up, um, and I don't think it'll sidetrack the conversation, but it, it, it came up in Esther's conversation, is, is the sort of disappearance of pro-democracy Republican Party here in the U.S., the conservatives who, who actually like democracy, who do not think the election was stolen. And, and this is something that Felicia brought up earlier. And it seems like with the loss of power of this group of people and it, uh, with them disappearing, we're losing the ability to, to protect the vote. Um, so, so having said that, um, Ashley, are you responding to this line of questioning or the previous one? Because I also want to make sure I don't ignore Darren, but I don't want to lose this momentum. So um, go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, it was this. I mean, I, I think there's a, a two pronged thing here. We're, we're at a place where we're very close to voting being completely illiberalized, right? And so there's this like immediate need to stop that gap, even if we aren't getting the best elections, is to make sure that voting still is voting, right? And not le legislatures aren't overturning votes, right? So there's that immediate need. But then there's like, the media sphere, and I would say that very broadly, the media sphere, right? The business models even of our news channels in the 24 hour news cycle and the shift to keep up with Fox or whatever are undercutting democratic norms are undercutting as, as well as, as other things. And they're promoting things. I, I, it was the correspondence center that Michelle Wolf did. 
and you know, where, where the big flap was her, her dig at, at um, Mike Huckabee's daughter. And she said, you know, she, she uses the ashes of burnt facts to, to do her eyeliner or whatever. And everyone actually ignored the majority of Michelle Wolf's talk, which attacked the media for their complicity in undermining democracy. And so we do not talk enough about this. We still treat our contemporary media as if it is some bastion of democracy and its business model is just absolutely not. It runs on the same sort of hate and rage model and constant information model that undermines institutions. And that's a thing I think a, a bed we need to see to at the very least alternative media and people are starting to move that way, but we need to do more of that. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna jump to Darren and then Marilyn. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so much of the conversation we've been having around this to me really comes back to the idea of incentive structures and particularly within media, whether it be traditional media, whether it be online media, if you have a well-reasoned, well-thought-out thesis, that's unlikely to get traction. That the people that get the length of viewership, the people that get the repeat views, are the ones that are willing to say the things that other people are not willing to say. And this is part of the incentivized structure of it. You think about some of the people that have been name-checked over today and yesterday, people like Tucker Carlson, people like Ben Shapiro, if they had a well-reasoned argument, they would not have the notoriety, they would not have the fame, they would not have the platform upon which to say the things that are able to reach a much broader audience. And so the incentive structure in so many ways, coming back to Rick's earlier point about ideology is perhaps less important than the incentive structure that underlies the entire process itself, which is, uh, is a big part of this underlying conversation. And to bring it to the idea of voting as well, one of the things that makes the United States very irreg irregular and, and very particular is its primary voting process, where we have different districts, where we have two candidates run against each other, uh, and you have a voting process before that. So rather than having the full political spectrum within an area, voting for like the most centrist candidate, which is what would produce the most average candidate, you have two different continua that are there that will produce more extreme candidates. As we engage in progressively more and more gerrymandering over time and over space, we get much more extreme sort of like districting in that sort of way. So we've got people rather than having the full um, sort of like continuum, the continuum is getting shorter. And so the average position within each region is getting bigger. So again, looking to incentive structures to try and get um, to try and get elected and stay elected. If we have uh, progressively more and more gerrymandered districts with more and more extreme positions in either political direction, then the incentive structures push us to having more and more extreme rhetoric, more, more extreme policy, and more extreme politics writ large within the United States. Thank you, Darren. Marilyn. Yeah, I think uh, a number of people have raised the issue of, of institutions, which are so important because there's been, um, there's a tremendous mistrust in a lot of institutions. It's been amazing for me as, you know, being in this, um, business of looking at extremism for 25 years to see how the FBI is being presented right now within the conservative sphere, you know, as a, as a something, as a grouping to not trust at all. But what I, I have done some uh, research that um, I, I didn't actually write the report about the right-wing media, and I'm talking about online publications and not Fox, but these really small publications like Revolver as one, uh, as an example, which is run by Darren Beatty, who used to be in the Trump administration, but had to leave because he went to a white nationalist event. I don't think he would have, you know, I, 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 in any case, uh, he is someone who does this, um, the, you know, the fear and the fear factor. He, he writes these stories that are based on, totally on conspiracy um, and not on facts. And then he is a guest on Tucker Carlson's show. Um, and, and he has him on quite often to talk about the theory. And then, you know, Carlson verifies that by, you know, promoting it. And it, then it gets back into the right-wing media the next day into a widening grouping of, you know, right-wing media outlets online. And so, I you know, I think there's... Um, there's a lot that's going on that's feeding all, all the things that we've talked about today. I think that, um, you know, there used to be, and I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to have the exact reference, 
but I know there was a, a rule years ago before cable, you know, where um, the FC, I, again, I apologize my, for my ignorance, but you know, that where uh, you had to have, um, people had to present- um, Yeah, both people, sides. Both sides, thank you. I, yeah, it, was thank called, you. it was called the Fairness Doctrine and it went away yes. and cable TV never, never um, ascribed to it. Right. So I think, you know, I think that's definitely played a role. And, and I want to I want to just mention that I'm sorry for not like having the reference at hand, but thank you, Georges. And also, I want to just someone asked this before about what do people like, for example, in the Republican Party do um, who want to who, who don't believe in election fraud, who don't believe in these conspiracies that we've been talking about. And and um, I know that um, I have heard even from my own relatives who do watch Fox News, but are concerned about some of the things they're seeing, that if someone um, else, like for, as an example, as, as Liz Cheney or someone who's challenged um, some of the views we're seeing was to, if, if, if that person was to run, um, they might consider voting for a, a third party candidate, um, as long as that person held some of the values that they themselves hold and, you know, I, you know, conservative values. So, I think that we might actually see a third party emerging at a certain point, um, you know, in, in the elections. And um, yeah, those are the points I wanted to make. But um, there's there's a lot that I think is moving right now that we we just don't know how it's all going to pan out. So um, I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you, Marilyn. So. Um, before I invite Todd to, to respond, I, I wanted to just say explicitly that we timed this symposium in October, knowing that that we're on the precipice of, of you know, be, shifting to a new place. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why Victoria and I wanted to have a, a mechanism for us to continue to, to meet and, and, you know, find ways to move forward in democracy. Um, and so let me just put another plug in for this forum that's going out. If you're interested in being a part of it, we don't know what it's going to look like. Um, I know that the College of Public Health here is very interested in, in facilitating it. Um, so so in the liveliness of this conversation is really showing that, that you know, we're a little lost, but we have some ideas. Um, but we need to talk to each other because as much as people have been grappling like this in their own spheres, um, as Felicia has, has really demonstrated, um, it's good to talk to other people who are grappling with some of the same problems. Um, and, and that's what our goal is. Um, Todd? Yes, um, I just wanted to throw out another uh, policy angle on this, and that is um, uh, the advertising space that supports a lot of the disinformation that we're seeing. Um, uh, you know, it's a money maker to put out clickbait um, because it brings uh, eyeballs to advertising to advertisements. There's two organizations that's worth um, promoting here. One is Check My Ads, uh, and the other is the Disinformation Index. Um, uh, both of those organizations work specifically focused on defunding these ads. Check My Ads just was able to pretty much defund a uh, ban and show. Um, simply by letting advertisers know that their ads are being shown on these sort of extreme um, locations. And businesses, the way the advertising models work online is oftentimes they don't know where their ads go. Um, uh, uh, but once they do find out, they can then control um, uh, where their ads go or, or limit their ads being shown on certain networks or certain places. So I think that's just another uh, important remedy to think about in this place that doesn't get much attention. Thank you, Todd. That's very appealing. <laughs> I come from a policy background and to find to find a way to kind of use the, the power against the bad stuff, I think is is really appealing. Um, other comments or questions? Do, does anyone have I haven't been able to keep up with the chat, um, but does anyone have anything that they'd like to raise that came up in the chat or the, I believe the last question came at, at 1110. So I think we answered it. Okay, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna then come back yeah. to the the thing that's been really compelling to me about um, the the sort of evisceration of, that may be a dramatic word, but it doesn't feel like it at this time of the um, conservative 
Republican Party who doesn't fall for the, the big lie and, and some of these other things. Um, it, it's been really hard to, to see my Republican friends just lose touch with with their party and not really know what to do. And and as much as, you know, I, uh, I'll i come out as a Democrat, as much as, you know, I'd like to think that they would join the Democratic Party, I don't think that's the solution either. It's not what democracy is. Um, you know, I, is it, any suggestions, any ideas? Um, I, I mean, I, I heard Marilyn say that there'll be a natural third party that may be coming out of all of this. There was a comment um, in the chat about if Liz Cheney runs, that, that that may inadvertently turn into something that that helps Trump get election elected. Um, that was earlier in the chat. Um, it is a conundrum. I'll, I'll just... I'll chime in on one item here, and that is, um, you know, back. I think it's helpful to think about influencers and credible voices in this space. Um, if the goal is to uh, help address the radicalization that um, uh, and radicalization is not just happening in, in conservative circles, but it's certainly happening in some conservative circles. So to help address that, ultimately, it's going to be the key of uh, responsibility of those uh, other conservatives who don't have those views. Liz Cheney's obviously on the forefront of that. Um, uh, it, there is obviously a challenge, though, that once you start doing that, you start to lose your credibility. <laughs> Liz Cheney, I'm sure, is, uh, loses a lot of credibility amongst those uh, most extreme uh, ranks. But she probably has a lot of credibility in those that aren't aren't that extreme or in the more moderate side or those who could get pulled one way or the other. So it's an important battle to fight. Um, uh, and obviously it has to be more than Liz Cheney. So I think the key the key policy issue here uh, is how do you how do you identify more folks um, uh, who can who can play that role? You know, the Democratic Party certainly needs its moderating agents as well. So it's not a it's not a partisan issue, um, but each of these partisans are experiencing their own form of um, uh, sort of extreme politics, and it's really going to be up to the moderates to help address that. Um, uh, so, thank you, Felicia. I also think part of this is in the the recruitment of of candidates, which is. Uh, it, you know, a very specific kind of thing that happens. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I have, I feel like I've seen a shift um, in my time during public service, I think, um, is the reasons why people are being, why people are doing this work. Uh, and, you know, I think of some of the folks um, on the, the far right um, who, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, and, and I don't know, I, I do not know her. I don't, and so I'm not speaking um, from something personal, but I wonder about is, what's her vested interest in the public good and the work that we're supposed to be doing when we are part of government? Um, and when we get to, when we are, I mean, I take very seriously the fact that I, I am elected, um, you know, by a hundred thousand people here um, to do, do work, do good work by them, not to get clicks, not to get, not to sell products, not to do any of that. Um, and I just, I wonder about the, you know, again, the influence of social media and advertising, um, you know, and actually all the things that you are, have been talking about in terms of folks' motivation and then the stage that they have um, from those elected positions. And we and I wonder about getting so far away from the work that we are actually supposed to be doing as a representative of people um, rather than um, our own individual gain. Rick. So for the historians in the room, I'm not one, but I, I love uh, uh, history and, and I should be reading more journal articles, but I just read more history books. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, as as you've already mentioned, and I think context is very important, this is not the first time. <laughs> it's not the first time there have been huge pendulum swings toward 
populism, which is, I really think, what we're talking about here in the past. I mean, what, what were the patterns of things that were practical that helped to encourage the pendulum to swing back away from populism in the past? I was preparing some materials recently, and I think like the height of the awesomeness of nonpartisan public service, like Dwight Eisenhower, I was reading some of his speeches about um, the proliferation of nuclear technology when I was thinking about the proliferation of internet technology and disinformation. And um, wow, the guy was so on, you know, on the spot and, and, and you could agree with him as an American, a freedom loving American, even if you totally disagreed with you know, some specific policy items because his values were so clearly um, sort of on the right page. So if that's the low point of populism, how did we swing back to that from the 1890s, right? Do any historians wanna respond to that? <laughs> yes, Adrian, is that is that a response direct? Yeah, it's although Carmen, did you want to before I because I feel like I I she said go ahead. Um, oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um so what do I think? I think one that there have been moments when there's been a shift away from populism, in part because the populist either the ethos or the goals have been incorporated into the mainstream. Right. So you think, um, I mean, the actual populists, the kind of 1880s agrarian insurgents who, you know, they get folded into some parts of the Democratic Party. But that sort of goes like that becomes it influences the progressive era enough in a way that like things happen through political processes. Right. Then you get the populism that's just about demagoguery. Right, which is kind of appealing to people's people's baser stuff, and some of that is like sometimes it goes too far. So some of it is decried. I mean, when I said I was like I miss local newspapers, I was like I miss Edward R. Murrow, and I wasn't even alive when Edward R. Murrow was alive. Right, but this kind of sense that there used to be kind of kind of national spokespeople who would pause and ask what is our what is our conscience and where are we in this right in some ways you know dan rather's savage tweets while he's in his 90s are the vestige of that um but it's also the case again like you know on the one hand eisenhower occupies this one spot where he can kind of you know speak values at the same time, Eisenhower was also really reluctant to deal with the populist reaction to Brown, right? Like he did not, he didn't want to have to deal with, with the dawning mass movement that was the civil rights movement and that was massive resistance, right? right? And that's kind of where that that energy went. And one of the things that happens in that moment, again, is that the kind of the rage and the discontent of folks who oppose the civil rights movement becomes political fodder. It's how the Republicans see their way to it's the rebirth of the Klan and the John Birch Society and all yeah, that. And it's stuff, first, right? and it, yeah, and it's sort of, you know, mutes itself or sort of like brings its like level of screaming down a notch so it's palatable but the underlying ideas don't disappear and I was thinking about this when Felicia was talking about working in a state legislature and wondering what it means to inherit the structures the ideas that the legislature produces and not know what they are but still be acting within them. Because so there's a um, historian at the St. Louis University Law School, Anders Walker, who wrote a book called Ghosts of Jim Crow about how state legislators in, I think, definitely Virginia, maybe also Georgia, but they rewrote Jim Crow legislation into colorblind language 
so mm-hmm. that it could do its work long after people who were invested in it were there to do its work, right? But if you join that state legislature in 1980, and you haven't been fighting this, and you don't feel like you need to be responsible um, for that history, and you don't know that you're carrying that history forward, then like, who are you and how do we work with that? And what does that mean for our current democracy? Right. Yeah. So, you know, we've all seen the movie Idiocracy, I hope at this point, and we hope that we're not going down that road. Um, no, thank you so much, Adrian. I, I think that's a really great answer. I was even thinking earlier about Andrew Jackson, but, but on Eisenhower, I'll say this, I think, um, uh, uh, I think uh, even since I was a really, really young kid, one of the eternal truths of American politics since the founding of the country is eventually everybody hates a moderate. (laughs) (laughs) That's so sad. (laughs) They're my heroes. Moderates are my <laughs> heroes. Compromisers are my heroes, right? And but, I'll also just quickly add, I also think about Lyndon Johnson a lot, who was yeah. in some ways, like, if you listen to him, if we're again talking about sort of people and how they present, just terrible, right? Foul-mouthed, vulgar, casually racist, like all sorts of things. And we can talk about his foreign policy and how it's a kind of messed up outgrowth of his kind of domestic vision. But on some level, that's also a person who believed in the democratic institutions and the potential for government to do good more than he believed in his own kind of like doctrinaire personality driven position. And so, you know, what you want is to remind people that that sort of public service ethos doesn't have to exactly mirror like who they are like in the pool room with their cigar and to remind voters like we care less about how they sound than what they do. Yeah, Yeah, that's not happening right now at all. I know. know. (laughs) Dicks and stones, that whole thing when I was a hundred years ago when I was young, that's out the window, right? Words matter too much, I think. That's personal opinion. Thank you. Um, Felicia. And so does civility, by the way. Yeah. I just wanted to quickly say, Adrian, yesterday you were talking um, about kind of zero sum. I mean, as we were talking about the swing, the populist swing, um, part of the notes that I wrote down when I was thinking about what you were saying was, is the scarcity model part of what, uh, you know, what really makes this jump off, uh, you know, and and starts that swing, you know, that sense of like, well, you're getting this, so I'm not, you know, rather than looking at from a very, you know, in my mind, you know, as a psychologist, right, as a clinician, I think about, like, well, can't we, and I actually just said this to folks, we are doing this ourselves a disservice, even in my own caucus, when we look at, at problems and the way that we are functioning from a scarcity model, rather than a strength space. And we are missing opportunities when we are doing that. Um, and so I just, I wonder about what you were talking about yesterday and this question that you were just addressing uh, today um, and just wanted to throw that out there. And, uh, um, I don't know if you wanted to respond or. I mean, I was just gonna quickly say that in some ways it comes back to the narratives that you get people to buy into, right? They're so, that they're, they're so wedded to the, that both, you know, people are wedded to a sort of scarcity zero sum model. We then as folks who are trying to mobilize and organize react and sort of work within that. But it's actually, it is hard to produce a different story, a story of strength that pulls on people in the same way. I really love um, Heather McGee's book, The Sum of Us, where you know she she does, she sort of comes out of the sort of social and economic policy world. She's got an undergraduate degree in American studies, and she talks a little bit about. I asked her once, like, what does what does that degree? How does it shape her policy work? And she was like, I came to understand these things that we've said. You can hand people all of these reports with all of these figures, and they can't get past their narratives of zero sum to see what I'm saying. And so I realized that I need to formulate a different story for them, which I think I'm just repeating back to you what you said, citing other people, but um, I I agree that it's hard work, but necessary work. Thank you so much. Um, TM. Uh, I wanted to add something what Adrian uh, said before, how can we make the pendulum swing, swing back 
um, all those populist ideas. And she said, sometimes it happens that these populist ideas disappear because they get actually disappear in the mainstream. And this happens all the time. We can see it here that there's some ideas that I sometimes say the mainstream is sometimes more radical than some of the ideas the Klan had in the 80s. And Germany was the same thing, that the mainstream parties had more, um, had more, um, was more radical than the right-wing parties in the 80s and 90s. And a big problem is that too, since some of these ideas are sought up. For one example, in Germany, it was uh, multicultural doesn't work um, because there was a problem where can we find the middle between multicultural and assimilation? And they only said multicultural uh, society will work, which didn't. And then they had a problem with, uh, with all these immigrants coming in in 2015. And the government hit that a little bit. And, and, and after that, the right-wing parties uh, said, oh, this was, that, that's what we said like 15 years ago. And now you're, you're agreeing. So who lied 15 years ago? I saw the government, who lied? So now all of a sudden you have right-wing parties that have 20% of the votes because of that. And here in the US, another example is too, like, like the Klan said in the 1980s, uh, white people will be the minority in, some, in, in the US at some point. And they came up with what I remember in, in, 20, uh, in 2040 or something. Well, Memphis, white people are the minority already. <laughs> so they could say, look, we have been right. The problem is, no one wants to agree with the Nazis or the racists over the far right. Therefore, we always tend to, when they are hate mongering, when they're coming out with these facts, when we have the same phenomenon right now with what, what, what they call the never Trumpsters, no matter what Trump said, it was all wrong. And then something was true. And they said, oh, who lied now? And you had the same thing. Now, oh, the Klan was right in the 80s. And everybody said that's just hate mongering. These, these things are not true. Um, well, all of a sudden, the liars, because nobody wanted to agree with the Klan. But this is what extremist groups do. They pull these facts. It was the same. Uh, a German politician of Turkish descent also said, Germans will be the minority in certain cities in 2020. Look at Berlin. It's like, it is what it is. And said, so, oh, they already admitted it in the 90s. And no, you know, but everybody else lied about it. So this is also something we have to tackle before it happens before things get sought up by the mainstream and say, okay, these things that populists say are true, but they are not necessarily problems. We have to tackle it now from a different perspective. There's, it's not hate mongering, that is true, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. And this is, this is a big problem because again, afterwards it becomes true and the populists will say, well, we said that 20 years ago and then they get the votes and everybody's wondering why that happens. Thank you, TM. Um, Carmen. And thinking about what um, Adrian was saying and others about, you know, kind of the scarcity model, it gets me back to thinking that, um, you know, that's the society that we live in, right? We're in a capitalist society. So by definition, it's scarcity, right? The exploitation of certain people. Um, labor, um, you know, um, wealth in the hands of a small amount of people and, you know, the rest of us fighting, you know, kind of to get our share and how it is that power structures play upon um, that fear and, and scarcity and, and, and the creation of, uh, you know, racial categories and all other kinds of categories in which to um, keep the masses of people kind of fighting at one another while the um, elite continue to, you know, accumulate wealth. And, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, various um, aspects in society of, of scarcity, thinking of, of, you know, Naomi Klein, you know, the shock doctrine, disaster capitalism. All of those things are kind of part of the structure from our founding of our nation. And so I think some of the things that um, we have to do is as we understand that this is the structure and the framework and the model from which our nation was founded that is part of our DNA, um, then I think this conversation about how it is that we get um, society and people to think that they're part of a whole and of a collective and part of, um, you know, 
am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you know, are we together as one, um, as a people, instead of buying into um, the stratification and the divisions in society, how it is that we can see people, each other as on the same team and as part of one family, because the structure of the United States and of capitalism and all the other um, stratifying things that we have in society is meant to keep us divided and people buy into that for a variety of reasons as we've discussed. And so I think by kind of understanding the systems and structures that are at the foundation of how our nation is, it was founded and continues to um, operate in is kind of, um, once we understand that, then that is the path to kind of um, you know, mitigate that and disrupt that um, in trying to um, work with people as we've been talking about um, on a more local and personal level to get people to understand that we are all on the same team moving in the same direction. Um, that idea though is antithetical to the system and the structure that we've established in the United States by our um, uh, capitalist model and so um, it's in the interest of big business, of corporations, of even our government structure to not have people be together because if that's the case, then you're not gonna have um, the structure of the United States that we have. You're not gonna have power concentrated into the hands of the few. You know, that's not gonna be the way our society is. So you're gonna get a lot of pushback from that. And because people have vested interests um, whether it's white supremacy or whatever group you want to have in kind of protecting their own, um, this is this is the space in which we're operating in. And so I, that's why I think, you know, that it's really in kind of important to understand kind of the structure and environment that we operate in, which everyone here has articulated well, and how it is that we can um, disrupt that and mitigate that um, you know, in all the spaces that we can. And, and I love the conversation that we're having around that, but, you know, that is kind of the structure that we're operating in. I mean, that's the water that we're in. I mean, that, that is the United States. That's what our system, our government, our politics, our business environment, that, that's what it is. And so we have to really kind of understand that, that anytime you're trying to disrupt that, you're really talking about <laughs> disrupting the whole uh, structure of the organization of our society that has been established from founding and, you know, and then deal with kind of the pushback from that and how it is that our citizens have bought into that, not kind of thinking of it, you know, historically, but just in their own kind of um, identity politics. So that, those are some of my thoughts. Thank you, Carmen. I, I think you did a really great job of summing up the conundrum that, that we're in. Um, but I also appreciate the focus, uh, the, the how you highlighted the importance of being at the local level, um, because that is a little bit more tractable. Um, but it is a conundrum, capitalism, for sure. Um, Rick? So um, I just had to say, Carmen, uh, just as I am apparently not a historian, but I read that stuff all the time, you're doing a fantastic impression of a sociologist. So <laughs> really well done. Um, uh, uh, you know, and, and those kind of criticisms, of, and, and obviously there are no pure economic systems in existence, right? Um, I, I think those criticisms are good and fair and make sense and help us understand the institutions that we're in. But one of the one of the questions um, getting to the practical part of the um, and I don't disagree with you, right? But one of the one of the one of the questions that I think about a lot in in this part of the program where we're trying to think about really practical things and get specific is um yes uh uh we're moving towards for many years now a concentration of wealth that i'm not even sure that we saw during the robber baron era it's really really crazy how much concentration of wealth there is not just in the united states but definitely in the united states right um but also the level of disparity and relative de 
deprivation that are happening uh, right now because um, uh, when you have a window into the whole world through your TV or your computer that you carry around in your pocket um, and you really see what it's like for other people and you see the, the difficulty and the crunch that it's put on people uh, uh, recently with, uh, you know, inflation, uh, et cetera, and the difference that that makes in people's day-to-day -day lives. And the fact that they ascribe those problems to whomever happens to be in office at the time, even though, the, you know, government <laughs> doesn't have as much control over as people think. Um, uh, what do we do, right? I mean, we, because part of this populism that's occurring part of this narrative and part of this extreme right-wing Christian nationalist narrative in the United States is this whole success narrative. You'll be successful if you do what we tell you and you vote for this guy and, and, and God will make you rich because you'll be a good person and you go. It's, it's crazy the stuff that, you know, but it's been around for a really long time and it's kind of a, only a little bit skewing of the sort of, uh, you know, the, the Protestant work ethic, Christian or early Puritan narrative in the United States. It's always been there. It's always been an undertone. It's part of the fetish, fetishization of money in the U.S. And, and I think a lot of problems. Um, but numbers wise, it might be more pronounced and worse now than it's been in a very long time. There are all kinds of cultural things built to support it. Uh, and then what do we do? Yeah, that's that's it, Andy. That's that's the phrase I was looking for. Um, what do we do? I mean, what do we do about that? I, the fact is, we need to really change the narrative and, you know, stop what was started in the late 90s, where the the the, the traditional left in the United States moved much further towards the right and and undercut continued to undercut labor unions and labor interests and all that kind of stuff but i don't know how that happens well in some ways the prosperity gospel i mean that that's what keeps people from buying in. that was that's is what keeps people buying into the system and the structure that we have so that as long as I was saying in my talk, you know, it's like, come over here, you'll have land and wealth, just do what I say, and this will happen for you. And it doesn't happen, but you have to kind of keep buying into the prosperity gospel, um, because that's the system you have, and oh, I need to elect you, and I need to do that, instead of really looking at the society that people want to have, we're following then, as we follow the prosperity gospel, we're getting deeper and deeper into a system that continues to keep um, wealth and resources within the hands of a small group of people. And that then is what creates frustration in the masses and opens up doors. So, um, you know, as we begin to think of people as being part of a larger um, community, caring and concerned about one another, and moving away from um, thinking that, um, you know, um, I don't know, I just think from, from the local level and from kind of thinking that we're part of one um, is one way to mitigate um, falling prey to this prosperity gospel narrative. I'll say that. Thank you, Carmen. Felicia? I think Adrian was before me. Um, so I'll be quick. I was going to say one, Carmen, I hear you as saying, how do we do an updated version of the SNCC project of creating a beloved community, right, which had built into it critiques of systems of political economy that were excluding. I also, I mean, it goes back to our earlier conversation about how we get away from a zero sum. Part of the story here is also, um, about getting people to understand that buying into this narrative, right? That anything is possible, right? Because you can be invested in capitalism and understand that it is a system that where some people are not going to win or you know, win everything. And what happens with the prosperity gospel, the language of, you know, you win if you have God's favor, 
is that it allows people to think, rather than thinking structurally, they come to believe that they're, they're losing out must be somebody else's fault or else it is their own fault. And the kind of damage, that kind of pressure that that puts on oneself, like, of course, you're going to try to externalize that on someone, right? And in some ways that links back to your very first, your talk, Carmen, where you were basically kind of talking about Du Bois and whiteness as a psychological wage, right? Like here are these folks, hard scrabble white people. They're not the Southern elites. They don't get the spoils. And what the elites hand them is that it's okay, you're white and that's something. You can't eat whiteness. You can't clothe your children in it in that way. So it's not very nourishing, but it was what they had. And so in some ways, we're looking at the legacy of that kind of argumentation, that kind of ideological investment, and we're trying to figure out how to undo what it has become in our lifetimes. Well put, well put. Um, Felicia. You know, and again, thinking from the clinical perspective uh, and how this continues to be um, perpetuated, I think about you know the strongest form of reinforcement is intermittent reinforcement. And I think that's also part of what we're talking about right now is intermittent reinforcement. And Esther was talking about this in terms of their elections, you know, and, and what's happening is that when folks um, have this sense of like, oh, I got something from this model, right? Like from this model, from this, cap let's use the United States, from this capitalist model, I got it. But for, you know, for years don't, you know, they don't get anything and then get a little, little bit again, we know that that's what keeps people invested in terms of behavior. Uh, and so I hadn't thought about that until Carmen, you were talking, uh, that Adrian was talking. I was like, that, like on an individual level, I feel like trying to break that intermittent reinforcement is really challenging because it's so powerful. Yes, if, if we give up now, we might miss the, the big pie, the, the prize for sure. Um, Ashley. So um, I just, I wanted to say like a word that's become sort of a, a word that I've hinged on throughout the symposium, starting with Carmen's talk is um, expectation. And when Carmen said it yesterday, right, intra-white struggle, which is something that I think about in my work as well, right? Like what hit me was when you listen to extremist narrative and extremist propaganda and, and the rhetoric, even the visual rhetoric of extremism, right? You have a, a group that that says I did all the right things, but I didn't get what I was supposed to get, and that has to be someone else's fault. Whether it's women's fault, anti-feminism, right? Those uppity women. Whether it's people of color's fault, black people's fault, Mexican people's fault, Muslim, right? Like it, it, it had. There's this problem with expectation, which is somehow linked to privilege. I'm still working my way through it. That cycle of whiteness, expectation, and privilege. That also believes it's okay to commit violence in the face of that, right? That the response, the appropriate response to that is, is if you're pushed too far is violent. Um, and definitely grievance narrative, Mer Meryl. Um, but I, I think what would it look like, especially given the sort of disparity, because what I, what I put in the chat was like, in this period of like growing wealth disparity, right? The people most displaced right now are, are actually middle-class white people in terms of wealth disparity and their expectation. And the people who showed up at January 6th were who, right, predominantly. And the people who are in militias, like you can't be poor and be in a militia. You can't afford the gear. You can't be poor and go play in the woods with the accelerationists. You can't afford the gear, right? Like there, there's stuff going on here that a better intersectional analysis of class and race and gender, I work on it, I'm, you know, it's a big project, but like we need to get at, and we, and we, we shy away from, that type of intersectional analysis in our trans and interdisciplinary work in some ways because of our disciplinary concerns. And I think for the scholars here, right, maybe a lead through on the idea of expectation in terms of crossing border, like disciplinary boundaries, like a framework like that might be useful for us to think in new ways, right? Because I can see that having a psychological component, a criminological, but I can see that having components for all of us. I don't know, just the thought. Yeah, Ashley, I've been personally very worried about being profiled lately. Am I allowed to be funny? Am I allowed to tell jokes? <laughs> <laughs> so that should have gotten a laugh. Totally allowed. Yeah. Totally allowed. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.